Welcome to Your Town. My name is Stanley Mickelson, and my guest today is Bristol County Sheriff Thomas M. Hudson. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Stan. Great to be here. Um, glad to have you here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Tom, uh, let's let's just start. You know, from the beginning. I know you started here. I think uh, in 1994. Is that what it was? Uh, well, I the actually. Sheriff's Department. Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. uh, I was. Um, I started out as the um, uh, head of internal affairs, the law enforcement division, mm -hmm. and I served as the sheriff's liaison to the chiefs of police. Uh, in 94, December 94, I came on. And then um, I served for, for about two and a half years, and the sheriff uh, decided to step down before the end of his term. And at that point, um, Governor Weld uh, appointed me to finish that, that term. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I began my, my election cycle for 19, in 1998. And now I've run for three separate elections, six-year terms, and I'm up again in, in 2016. 2000, next year. Uh -huh. Yes. And um, will you be running for re oh, re-election? Absolutely. Th this is a job, you know, <laughs> I've had people ask me, you know, are you looking to seek higher office and so forth? And, and uh, I have to tell you that this job is probably the most diverse job, if you want it to be, where you can maximize your resources to mm. give people back a return on the investment that they've made in having to, to operate our jails every day through their tax dollars. There are a lot of policy issues that you can get involved in, that you should be getting involved in, uh, both locally and nationally, that uh, are impacting the public safety, not only of our communities, but our national security. Mm. I'm sure. So I love the job. So, yeah. And I'm, I'm very blessed and fortunate and that the people you're... of this county have given me the privilege to serve yes. them. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people, because of the proximity of the jail, obviously, in Dartmouth, um, and this is programs about Dartmouth, your town, um, so what kind of impact would you say financially and other uh, for, for, the, uh, for the position of the jail being in Dartmouth, Mass? Well, um, certainly the, the, um, the, the impact of, of, um, of the services that we can provide uh, will help the town of Dartmouth to cut their costs. Uh, we provided, I believe we provided a salad bar for, for one of the schools here. We, we do, uh, we do training uh, for uh, emergency response in the schools. We do anti-bullying training. But we also, when these are, these are savings from the standpoint of not having to pay somebody to come in and do this training. But in addition to that, uh, the cleanups we do, the painting that we do uh, in the community, government buildings and, and so forth, uh, the senior center in Dartmouth, the inmates uh, plant flowers. They, they, I think we've painted that entire building. And we're constantly out there looking for ways to to save the town money by, by utilizing the resources that we have. In addition to one other thing, which is I think over time we've given uh, a number of uh, different not-for-profit agencies or, or government agencies uh, excess furniture that was former military furniture but in good shape. Mm, that's terrific. So those are huge cost savings that generally aren't looked at. Yeah. Uh, because um, otherwise the town have to go out and buy new, new things. And, uh, and of course, uh, our local police, day, uh, police department, um, you work closely with them. Uh, maybe you can, you can we do. talk a bit about that. Uh, we do. Which um, is quite important for uh, public safety. Absolutely. I mean, we have canine, of course, that respond to communities throughout this county. If there's a bailout or, or, or someone um, needs a drug search done, we, we do searches in the schools. We, um, we also, of course, I think, as you know, Stan, we, we uh, we provided the mobile command center when they had the, the problem down at the, the police station where they had to evacuate the police station. And they began to use our mobile command center as their communication center and their, their, their headquarters really to work out of there, which was a, a huge advantage as opposed to moving the entire department to some other location, infrastructure and all of that temporarily until they could get the problem uh, resolved. The, uh, the other thing that we do, of course, is we have uh, one or two members of the Dartmouth Police Department who serve on our, our uh, joint anti-terrorism task force. It's called SCAT, South Coast Anti-Crime Task Force. Mm -hmm. We have the largest uh, undercover task force in the entire state of Massachusetts. We're, uh, we have about 92 members that consist of members of the Dartmouth Police Department as well as uh, other law enforcement officers from other agencies throughout our county and even beyond, even mm -hmm. in Rhode Island. Some of them are participating. So so it's um, it's it's a way for us to to uh, 
to build this collaboration that we need that's cost effective, it's sharing of resources, saving taxpayers money, and also uh, improving the quality of life of the people from our communities. Speaking of quality of life, and um, uh, it's, um, I know you uh, instituted a program, a um, uh, learning program with Dr. Waxler, uh, and um, quality of life for, you, for, for the inmates, which is a big impact, uh, hopefully, that they, they, they won't return to, you know, their, uh, to the, once they, they, excuse me, once they get out, they'll, they'll have some uh, opportunities that they never had before. Yeah, and that's a really important point that you raised there, Stan, because most people uh, look at jail as a place or a prison as a place where people are to be punished and just lock them up and they'll learn their lesson just by losing their freedom. But nothing could be further from the truth. These individuals, by and large, come in here with, with well-established, uh, long-practiced, dysfunctional behaviors. My job as a sheriff, and I think every sheriff in the nation, ought to be focusing on how do I put myself out of business? Because if that's what you're focused on, then you're focusing on making sure that while people are there, uh, that they're focusing on things that are gonna help them, programs, not lifting weights, playing basketball, hanging out and playing cards, watching TV, because honestly, I think if you or I were in prison and we had a choice between going to a substance abuse program because we had a substance abuse problem or playing basketball, lifting weights or whatever, we're gonna, go, we're gonna take the, the easiest choice. We're gonna play basketball and lift weights because why would I wanna open that, that closet door and go in that dark room and deal with those issues that, that are very difficult for me to deal with? So, so what we've done is, and, and, and I received a lot of criticism in the beginning for taking the TVs out of the cells, from eliminating the weights, for, for um, building in programs that were going to really impact the quality of life, not only for the inmate when they leave, but also the people of our community. Right. Uh, so, so that's working because inmates are, are getting involved in programs. We have a whole substance abuse unit that we're focused on. Dr. Waxer's program has been a fabulous program at Changing Lives Through Literature where inmates actually, and we even have some that are peer educators now uh, who will, will teach the, the course. And basically, they will uh, they'll read through this book and they will, they will sort of live through the characters in those books. They'll, because many of the people who have come to our facility can't speak of their own issues for, for a whole myriad of, mm -hmm. of reasons. <clears throat> but if they, can, if they can delve themselves into the book and carry their story through the character, it's easier for them to, to articulate the issues and begin, begin to bring it out, which is something that we really need to do for them to begin the process of change. We have another really neat program that we do with UMass Dartmouth with, Dr. Uh, with Professor Krumholtz. We've been doing it for years now, where if you sign up as a student at the university for the criminal justice history course, you will be doing her course at our prison with the inmates who also signed up. And it's inmate student, inmate student, they're never allowed to Terrific. sit in groups. <clears throat> and that's been hugely successful. And to be honest with you, at the graduation, the last graduation, it was wonderful to hear the students say, listen, you know what? You all, you inmates here made us better students. We, when we wanted to go out and go, instead of doing our homework, go to a bar or hang out and do something else, we knew that you were studying every night. Yeah. We knew that you were focused on your studies. And honestly, a number of you did better than we did in the class because of that. And and that was huge for the inmates to hear because you can imagine they're like very nervous about being in a classroom with college students because they probably don't believe that they could be a college student. Right. The college students in some respects have their own perceptions about inmates and wondering, okay, well, I'll do it, but have they're probably not going to make, yes. make much out of it if they're in prison. But the truth of the matter was it was a great, in addition to the course, the whole process of doing that was an incredible education for them and made them start to realize that, hey, maybe I can help other people, whether they're in prison or not, maybe who, don't, who have those disadvantages, mm. to help them get to a better place. So, uh, and the, by the way, the, the inmates, and all of them graduated uh, from the class, will get those credits if they enroll in college when they leave. That's terrific. So it's all about, you know, look, public safety stand is in my, my estimation, public safety is about making sure that we do everything we can to minimize the chances before somebody leaves prison to commit crimes against innocent people again. And the only way you can do that is if you have programs that focus on things that matter. Education. That, education, 
uh, and we have we have a we, have, we I developed years ago now a reintegration program where I have staff that are just focused strictly in the last six months on re they have inmates assigned to them and they they create a, a life plan for them before they leave. Mm. So if you have an, an alcohol problem or drug problem, you're going to know before you leave. If you live in Fall River, for example, or New Bedford or wherever, you're going to know where the AA or NA programs are, what the schedule is, and the days. So so you have that already ready for you. We have them connected to to um, to to job placement programs. We have them counselors out there that they can follow through with. So it's really an important, very important part of what we do. Um, and I, I know there's such a huge drug problem right now. Um, it's rampant. It's not just in, in Massachusetts. It's, uh, it's everywhere. Um, and it's even, you know, it, there are no boundaries. It's in our town, our small little town. It's, uh, so, so what are you doing? Um, what is the sheriff's department doing with the local uh, police departments, New Bedford, Dartmouth, Westport? Well, we're trying to go after the suppliers, of course. Um, that's our biggest target. But, but um, education in the schools, we spend a lot of time. I have a staff that, that, that educate the students in school. I do a program called Choices where I go in and talk to, to children about the simple message of choice. When you make good choices, you're in the most powerful place you can be. When you make bad choices and you go to prison, there's no call to mom when you feel sick. There's no deciding when you want to get up or when you're going to eat and what you're going to eat. Your freedoms and your choices are basically gone in life. And, and, um, and by making bad choices and getting involved with kids with, with drugs and things like that, that is the road you'll go down. And then after I finish, I have several inmates there who will talk about how they started out smoking marijuana, how it became a problem for all of them to a point where they got to jail. We do a program at the jail called uh, Project SLAM, Students Learning a Message. We bring in about two to three busloads of children every week who go into the prison, they go in the visit room and they hear from inmates what life is like in prison. It's interesting, um, the thing that really, really makes the younger children sort of gasp is when they tell them that they're in a cell with someone else with a sink, a toilet, and no walls around the bathroom. They just, they, they just, it, it's, it scares them. It freaks them out. Yeah. yeah. Then they get a chance to go in and see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after the inmates talk to them. The inmates are very real about it. They don't uh, put up any nonsense. If somebody's joking around or laughing, they'll call them out on it right there. Say, you know, this isn't funny. You know, you may think it's funny. You may end up in here, and when you do, I'm going to be here, mm. and you're going to have a problem. So it really, it's, it's, a, it's a very um, well presented program, a combination of the inmates themselves. And then the, we've actually had, I think, in two cases, <clears throat> one inmate was talking about being sexually abused. And we allow the students afterwards to talk to the inmates. They can go up and talk to them. Mm -hmm. We've had two separate incidents where children have walked over to the inmate and said, listen, I've been sexually abused. And we've been able to intervene, intervene at that point. Mm -hmm. When we learned it from the inmate told us, we intervened with uh, Child and Family Services to begin to get that child some help, which otherwise may never have come to the surface anytime soon. So there's so many great benefits out of this program that, that can be very useful and helpful to our children and, and to our community. Um, Homeland Security, and I know you're really uh, very much involved in it, not just locally, but nationally. Yes. and um, internationally, and we're so very fortunate to have your expertise just a few miles away. Um, I think we need to talk about, I think a lot of people are concerned about Homeland Security. As they should be. Yes. And, and you know, Stan, yes. um, look, <clears throat> I started the Homeland Security Task Force. I remember when I was, I went to Washington in 1998 to study uh, weapons of mass destruction. At that time, it wasn't called Homeland Security. And it was just the, the, in the beginnings of the evolution of law enforcement, understanding that we are now the front line of defense for our nation, our national security. Uh, we're the ones that have to get, gather intelligence in the streets. We knew Al Qaeda was here already in the 80s. They were dancing up in, there's, there's films of them uh, dancing in uh, halls above storefronts in New York in, back in the, the mid-80s. Uh, there's a, a clip that was done, a documentary called American Jihad that the congressman who be, uh, who are winning elections and for the first time have to watch this because it gives them an early understanding of how 
the um, terrorists have already infiltrated our society going back in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> when I came back, one of the things that I had learned down there was that we needed to start preparing, bringing law enforcement and fire service, our public safety community together. And I remember uh, we applied for a grant for, for a mobile command center, communication center for critical incidents. And I can remember a lot of criticism saying, uh, I believe a mayor in a different city had said, you know, the sheriff's chicken little. He's, he thinks the sky's falling. <laughs> and, and, um, and it isn't about being right. It's about being educated and, and, and knowing what you have uh, in the way of education to be able to carry that through for the people. So I, I knew why I needed it. I knew that we were going to be the first in the, in the Commonwealth to have had this. Uh, and so it was important for our people in our county. And do you know that that vehicle was supposed to be delivered uh, three days before 9-11 happened? Hmm. Ironically, I was literally on the front steps of the U.S. Capitol when those planes hit down there to testify on a prison reform bill. I came back up and we, I, I gathered um, many of my staff and some officers from, from Sturbridge and a couple of other, other communities that wanted to, to join us. And I took 50 people down there to Ground Zero in the rescue effort, and we spent five weeks there. And one of the things that we learned, the most important lesson, whether you were from California or wherever, if the most important lesson was we have to do a better job sharing information, networking, intelligence uh, gathering was critically important, and we needed to, to get out of those silos and start to pull together as a, as a community. Team, team efforts. Absolutely. Yeah. Organized team efforts. Right. And that's, that's the name of the game. It's, it's, and, and now, more than ever, we need to do this because we know that ISIS, and, and they, they're predicting at least 1,000 members of ISIS are, are in America today. Uh, they're plotting and planning. And these are, you know, they talk about the lone wolves. And these are people who could walk up to anybody in any community and say, hey, um, I want to talk to you a minute, pull out a knife, and kill you in a matter of seconds. And people can't, people can't say, hey, this is New Bedford, this is Dartmouth. And let me tell you why. Uh, my wife and I were, were planning a vacation. We went into a travel agency in, in New Bedford. When I came in, the, I asked the woman how it was going. She said, well, I've had better years. Uh, she had some personal problems, but she said, but I had a weird thing happen. I had three different calls through the TTY service and, and um, for hearing impaired, and, and, and there were requests at different times for two people at each request to go from uh, Accra in Africa, one to Paris and back, one to Johannesburg and back, one to New York, one way, and they were all three different credit cards, hmm. two people on each, and they were of Middle Eastern descent, with the exception of one of the six. I said, did you call the FBI? Yeah, we did. Did you hear back yet? Nope, we didn't. I have a portal at my facility that's connected, connected to the Defense Intelligence of Washington and portals of major cities where we can, in real time, pass information out. Mm -hmm. So you pass it, anybody see, had anybody going to a travel agency uh, through TTY asking for these kinds of reservations? You, they'll all know immediately. Somebody in California might go, yeah, we had a situation like that. Now we know we got a trend. Plug it all in though. Now we sure. got a trend. Yeah. Well, don't you know, uh, I had my, my uh, head of uh, my Homeland Security, Colonel Gavigan, get on that right away. Within a day, we got a response back, I believe it was TSA, said that you have um, two of your six people have no flight orders on them. We received a response back, I think from Secret Service or FBI, I can't remember which, saying five out of your six people have exact name matches for known terrorists. This is in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Yeah. So people got to realize it is here. It's here. It's here. And, and if people see things suspicious in their community that just don't look right, call the police. Let them know. Yeah. Because if your gut's telling you that something's out of the norm, you're probably right. Exactly. So it's just. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't. No, because, because honestly, the, the national security of this nation is dependent upon every single one of us, not just the people charged in law enforcement to, 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 de to sort of deal with the problem on a day-to-day -day basis. But every one of us have that obligation now because you don't know if it's a neighbor, a distant right. friend, you have no idea who the people are today who are being recruited. And we know they're going after young kids. Um, they're, they're infiltrating gangs, trying to get, the, 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 and, they, and they do it based on the, the gang mentality. I, yes. I have a family. You know, I don't have another family, a real family to go to, so I'll join this family over here because they'll recognize 
my achievements, even if it is stealing a car, but at least somebody sees that I've done something that I've achieved and they're going to recognize me for it. Unfortunate. It is as, unfortunate. As it may be. It really is. Uh, and and uh, I guess you just want to, everyone should truly understand that they are as responsible as the police department. Have to uh, be. And I, I can't enforce it more myself that, be aware, I think we all do that when we go to the airport now. Right. I think uh, we're all very much more aware of our surroundings, who, um, who sits near each other, and not to, you know, to single out any one person or any group of people, but just be aware of what's going on around you. Absolutely, you know, and that's really supermarket. important. Supermarket, anywhere you go, it doesn't matter. That's happen. really yep. important, Stan. That's, yep. Look, the, the law enforcement's only as good as the resources that support it, exactly. and the people, are, the people are our best resource. So getting back to the command center, if it were not for you to, to, uh, to appropriate it's, uh, this, this great vehicle, We'd, we would have had our hands full in Dartmouth when we had the problem at the police station, as you mentioned earlier, and I thank you uh, uh, for offering it immediately. Yeah, we're hoping uh, that a similar, yeah. we're hoping that a little different situation. Their roof caved in, and yeah. they needed some community, of course they needed emergency communication yeah. immediately. Yeah. We got it out there. Yeah. We're using this vehicle stand to, uh, great. to train the schools. We're going to fire departments, making sure that the fire, the fire personnel know that when it arrives in that community, they have people trained to use it. Because we're not, I'm, I'm not going to be, I didn't buy it for me. I bought it for the people of this county. Mm -hmm. So when it rolls into Dartmouth or anywhere else, it becomes Dartmouth's operation. If they want, we'll send two technicians for support. But if they need me to be there for unified command, I'll be there, but only at the request of the police chief or the fire chief. They right, are right. the commanders, not me. So, so as many uh, criticisms as there were that this is somehow buying a toy for the sheriff's office, <laughs> no, couldn't be further from the oh, truth. This is an important piece of equipment that now other departments of the sheriff's offices have have bought into it. And we all know from our experience in Dartmouth. How yeah, how and we also, just so you know, Stan, we run uh, the Homeland Security Task Force for the county. Uh, we're the only sheriff's department to do that. And we have monthly meetings. We have people from the CERT team from the National Guard. We have FBI. We have, state, uh, we have the U.S. Attorney's Office. We have uh, doctors, nurses, all the people who would be responsible for responding in a coordinated fashion, in a collaborative fashion, to make sure that we're, we're dealing with the emergency in a way, not when we get there, but doing tabletop exercises. We do those for, we did it for New Bedford, we've done it for a lot of communities where they can understand how to, how to be prepared. Well prepared. Yeah, yep. well prepared. Yep. They're not yep. surprised by it. Yep. Um, on, a, on a, maybe not a lighter note, but uh, I remember um, that you started this chain gang, they called it, and they made, um, excuse me, they made um, sort of light of what you did and they, uh, uh, and you took a lot of bad publicity, uh, but uh, is it still in existence? And can you tell the listening audience um, how well this program really did work or didn't work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, yeah, it's still, we don't have anybody out right now because we were, we were it depended on classification of, of inmates, but we are looking to expand that to make sure we get them out there very soon. Uh -huh. um, but uh, we had a staffing shortage, so that, that was a problem as well. But yeah, this program has been hugely successful. Uh, this was not a program to, to punish people. This was not a, a program to demean anyone. We've had so many requests for work all over this county through our 20 cities and towns that we just didn't have enough inmates to be able to manage it in a way. We prepare all the baseball fields. We did the Dartmouth field down here every year to get it ready for the Little League, mm -hmm. uh, paint the dugouts, do all those kinds of things. And uh, in addition to senior buildings and so forth. So, so in order for us to be as timely as we could and deal with the magnitude of the work that we've been asked to do every year, I said, look, let's offer it to the next level of classification with certain restrictions. You can't have an outstanding warrant. You can't go out if you've had certain types of crimes. Um, but they are generally people that are going to be have, have longer than six months on their sentence. So if they were made aware that if you want to go out and do a work program and help people in the community, you can do it, but you have to be on a restraint because of the, the level of classification you are mm -hmm. with more time. It's less likely for someone with six months or less to walk away because they're going to face two and a half years. So they're getting very close to the end. Somebody with six months or more, although not many would, there's always that temptation because it's a lot longer period of time. So in the interest of public safety, of course, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're not taking any of those risks. And the inmates that have been on it, Stan, have been very, we had guys who were on it who didn't want to go to the next level when they got to the six-month period. They wanted to stay with the team and work group. And, and I'll tell you, it, there was an interesting 
uh, anecdotal situation that happened when I first started when some of the legislators were saying, hey, you know, this is wrong and so forth and so on. And uh, it was Representative Poyer came to see the crews out in the community. And she said to the, I wasn't there. I made sure I wasn't there. She walked up to this crew and said to one of the, one of the inmates that was standing in the middle of the five, she said, do you really like being out here? Did you choose to do this yourself or did you did you, uh, were you, were you made to come out here? Were you forced to come out here? He said, oh, no, ma'am. He said, look, I, I volunteered to be here. He said, and I'm really glad I did. He said, because I have anger management problems, and this is really helping me because I'm in the middle of the, this, these, of the five people here, and I have to learn how to work with these people and in a coordinated way, which is helping me with my anger issues. I was on Johnny Cochran's show, uh, God rest his soul, and um, I had an inmate on a split screen, and there was a guy from Amnesty International, been very critical. They sent alert out all over the world, never told anybody it was a volunteer tandem work crew. And um, so I was getting faxes from places like China condemning me for UN resolution violations and all this <laughs> nonsense. So anyhow, so this guy's on there, and he starts saying, I don't question the inmate wanting to go out. I question the sheriff's judgment and putting him out there, demeaning them, and so forth and so on. So after he went on a little bit, Johnny Cochran said, well, Sheriff, I, I'm not convinced about this program, but I'd like to, I'm, I'm willing to hear, I'm willing to listen. So I said, well, Mr. Cochran, as soon as I said that, the inmate jumped in. And he said, Mr. Cochran, can I say something? He said, sure. He said, you know what? He said, I don't know who this guy is over here that's saying that the sheriff demeans me by putting me out there and forcing me to go out there. He said, first of all, I volunteered to go out. Second of all, I demeaned myself when I came to this prison and took myself away from my family. Good for him. And you know what? I, I want to go out every day and do good things for good people. It makes me feel good. And who is he to tell me I should sit in a seven foot by 10 foot cell all day when I can go out and do good things for people? And you know what, Mr. Cochran, when this show's over, you know what I'm gonna be doing? I'm going back to my cell, I'm doing my homework for a program I'm involved in here, and I'm getting up at six o'clock in the morning and I'm going to work. He said, what's wrong with that? Nothing. There's no answer. That was the inmate. That was <laughs> yes. the inmate on the tandem crew. And in management, and I'll end it with this, in management trainings around this country, there is a, a training module that they do where they actually tether executives together. And they have them do tasks to see who emerges, how they cooperate with one another. Hmm. So, so if they can do it in the business world, why wouldn't we want to give these inmates a chance to be exposed out there in the community where they otherwise would be in their seven foot by 10 foot cell let him go out and have someone like yourself who, who, who has stature and is well respected to walk up and say, guys, you're doing a great job. Yeah. That means a world to them because we need to reinforce those Changes things. Changes their life. Absolutely. And it makes, it, it makes them associate good behaviors yes. with good feelings and compliments that people they respect in the First community give them. Yeah, which is really so it's, it's, not a, uh, it's far different than, uh, than those who would suggest that, oh, he's, he's, he's uh, Till of a Hun, <laughs> cool hand Luke, wants to get him to go out and start breaking rock. Nothing gets bent. Always no one gets two sides from that. to every story. Well, of course, <laughs> of course. But I respect those who, who may yeah. have some other feelings about conjuring back to in history to, to slavery. But there's nothing about that any more than it would be for us to say close all the factories that used to be used for child labor, even though they're not used for child labor anymore. They're yeah. used for a different purpose. You know, where we're housing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a lot of cases. Yeah. Uh, considering our large immigration uh, uh, issues in this country uh, and f it's on the forefront everywhere uh, and in our large immigration uh, population uh, of immigrants and that are, that are legal and, it's, and some illegal but you've had some programs uh, through the, I guess through the, in the Azores I believe is, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I you really need to tell me more about that. Yeah, in, in 1999. We have so many uh, Portuguese uh, We do, and, we do, and they, yeah. then the Portuguese were largely responsible for building this, this region in the, in the way that we've uh, enjoyed no, a lot no of. No question about it. Hardworking. No question uh, about Strong it. sense of family, uh, strong faith. Work they, ethics. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I'd like to see us have more influence in the Portuguese community and some of our boards and so forth. But... Well, but, we've had, excuse me, but we did have the Azurian president come over. Oh, yeah. And we, we traded uh, um, uh, Sister cities, right? Yes, traded gifts, and I believe there's a trip planned for the summer. Oh, I'm very mistaken. good. Yeah. Oh, very yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, Dartmouth's been yeah. very active with the Portuguese yeah. community yeah, and the great terrific. partnerships. Yeah. yeah, we're very fortunate. Well, that's kind of how I started, actually, Stan. I, I, uh, the president of the Azores, Carlos Cesar, former president, 
uh, who's become a very good friend of mine over, over the years, uh, came to, <coughs> to the prison in, in 99, 98 actually. And we, f we signed a memorandum of agreement where we would help to prepare these deportees that are going to be going back to the Azores to understand the basic sort of nomenclature of the land, uh, how, how the, you know, the geography, uh, the denominations of money, basic things that they, they could understand so they wouldn't go there sort of completely cold to, to anything. And, um, and over time, we, we brought in their social workers and taught their social workers. They spent a week with us. We taught them how to create reentry programs and so forth. Today, they have uh, three transition houses in, in uh, San Miguel. They have two transition houses in the island of Tessera. And they're continuing to grow uh, their their um, outreach program for deportees who arrive. We've helped them develop protocols so that when they get off the plane, they don't just walk away into the into the hillside. You may have somebody that's a pedophile. Uh, you want to know that before they come. So we were able to work with Washington and get uh, get approval to have us give information to the consul, so the consul can pass that along, so they know who they're receiving. Medical information. We encourage the the deportees to to bring their medical files. We can't force them to do it. We can't give out the information because of HIPAA law. But it helps the, the receiving country not have to go through all the cost of testing and so forth and so on. So, so we've developed some really incredible programs. Having said that, I will tell you, uh, this immigration problem is probably one of the most serious problems facing our nation right now. Until we secure the borders of the United States, we will never, ever have legitimate, comprehensive immigration reform. And I've been working on this in Washington, going back to the days of Barney Frank and Henry Hyde, uh, yeah, uh, Representative Henry Hyde, who's since passed away, of course. But we got a bill through Congress back in 99, I believe it was, or 2000. It never made it to the Senate because it was a presidential year coming up and it was a political football as they've always continued to use it as. But I will tell you, I've been down to the borders. I've been to McAllen, I've been to El Paso. I'll be back down there again. And uh, I've been with uh, other sheriffs from around the country, and we're, we're going to be going back again. The, un, the unaccompanied minors that are coming into this country in huge numbers, I'm talking thousands, but it's over 16,000 since last March, come into this country. We all, in this, we're the most generous country in the world, Stan, and you and I would do anything as anybody would, uh, any of the people watching this show, to help any kid. We're, that's what we're about. That's, what, that's one of the hallmarks of our great nation. But we also have to be mindful of the fact that when you're encouraging these children to come here by themselves, mothers passing them off to coyotes, members of the drug cartel who are getting five to $7,000 per child, mothers who are giving their daughters, their teenage daughters, birth control pills because they know their daughter's going to get raped at least once along the way. Mm -hmm. Kids who don't make it from the border, to the border, with these coyotes who abuse them, some of them are left for dead. How in God's name is that humane? And imagine some of these teenage girls who've been raped by these, these coyotes along the way, coming to our country, no family support. They're going to be sent somewhere into the fabric of America in some neighborhood with some distant family friend, legal or not, or family member, distant legal or not, or put in some, some, some foster care place, which is another program that's being, being done in the United States right now. And what support, imagine, just take one of those, those poor girls. Coming here as traumatized as she's going to be, her family's back in another country, placed in some home, in some neighborhood, where she's going to be vulnerable again because the predators in our country know who the weakest links are in their neighborhoods likely will get victimized again, goes to school, is expected to learn without having anybody to help her process through what trauma she's been through. That's only one incident. That doesn't include the other kids that are all, you know, abused in different ways. How are we helping these children? We're not. If we want to really help these kids, let's do what we, we otherwise do. You're importing problems into our country that, that we can't manage. Set up foundations. We send money all over the world to, to Biafra, to other places, and people that want to support them and give to them, let's give to them. And then as far as the foreign aid goes, cut the, cut the foreign aid in these countries, such as Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, until they get their act together. If they're, if they're allowing 
uh, people to be um, oppressed because of, of crimes and gangs and whatever, and cut their aid until they get it under control. Look, Guatemala has 11% gross domestic product that they receive from people coming here illegally and sending their money back. Why would Guatemala or any other country who's benefiting by 11% of their gross domestic product want to discourage people from going to the very place where they're going to get that 11%? They wouldn't. So the government needs to get its act together here in this country. Congress needs to do what it should have done a long time ago. Congress needs to sit down. Look, we can, we've got such advancements in electronics and phones and, and all of these things that we can do and we can get to the moon with you know, space stations and all of these other things, but we can't sit down for 20 years and get a group of people in the immigrant community, law enforcement, members of Congress, and sit down in a room and craft a fair, legitimate immigration plan for this nation? Of course we can. Do you but see that happening? I, well, you know what? The sheriffs across this country are really bubbling up all over the place. They're really frustrated to being marginalized. And yes, I, we've been, I, we've been, I took 50 sheriffs I, from around the country and take them. They, they met me in Washington. I, I, I organized a group to go there. And at that time I testified before the House Committee, uh, Judiciary Committee on un, unaccompanied minors. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a press conference with Senator Sessions, Senator Vitter, and said, look, enough's enough. This is not about political football. This is about people's lives. We need, to, we need to create a system that gives a fair process that doesn't make people wait so long to try to get through the process. They need to revamp that. We need to, to have e-verify in this country and hold businesses accountable that are, are encouraging illegals and hiring illegals to, to do work here. Do you know that the, this is really kind of not funny, it's ironic and kind of sad. The, Immigration Naturalization Building, built in Providence recently. Do you know who built that? Illegal. Primarily illegals. Yeah. Uh, the Braga Bridge, when the Braga Bridge was being painted, seven of the workers had the exact social same social security number. You know, we have, we, have, we have police stations, town halls being built by illegals. I mean, and this is hurting the, the legitimate business people who have to build in costs for insurance for their employees, workers' comp, those kinds of things. These are things that they have to pay, and they can't compete because, and so American businesses are losing money and they're losing out on bids because they're being undercut by people mm. using um, uh, what they call he uh, heifers, which, which are people that have subcontractors that are illegal. There are things within our law in Massachusetts where a certain place you can go up to the Secretary of State's office and get a, and get a, get a, get a um, small business uh, permit without, with your passport. I mean, so there's a lot of problems here. There's some legislation that has to happen. Clerks need to be held accountable. Clerks are the works. But more than anything, um, what I explained recently at a seminar is I said, how many, we had about 300 people. So how many of you have a fence around your yard? Many of them did. Do you have a gate on the fence? Yes. So that's so you can allow people to come in and people leave uh, that you want there. It's not to be unneighborly. It's just that that's your domain. That's So... Let's pretend that somebody's in your yard and they're in a tent. You look out your, your kitchen window and you say, hey, there's somebody in my yard in a tent. They, they, I don't know who they are, they don't belong there. So you can call the police, say, hey, somebody's trespassing in my yard, they're, they're, they're setting up a tent, they're living in this tent, and the police come and, and they tell you, oh, uh, Stan, I'm sorry. Um, the mayor in your community has decided that if anybody can make it over the fence into anyone's yard, they get to stay. And you need to provide them Food, clothing, if they have a medical problem, you need to take care of it. Make sure that they can get to the schools and support them in the schools by, by your tax dollars. And if they want to, if they decide to leave your yard and go steal some things in the neighborhood, uh, you can't rem have them removed by the police out of that neighborhood until they have at least three convictions for misdemeanor. That's what the federal government's done now. They've raised the bar so that you can't really consider them for deportation until there are more crimes committed. And, and I said, so, so why is it then that when people who illegally come into this country are greeted when they violate our no trespass laws with open arms, given amnesty, a place to stay, and all of these things? Because we're basically saying that we're going to ignore the laws. 
And when the President of the United States sends a message, and think about the five million around the world who have been waiting their turn, respecting the laws of the United States of America, the message to them is, as President of the United States, I don't respect the immigration laws, um, and you shouldn't either. And shame on you for waiting. You should have come in like everybody else. Because that's where we are right now. And that's not... It's helter skelter. Basically. Yeah, and that's not a partisan <clears throat> comment. That's the reality of where we are right now. That the President of the United States, and when you, when you sanction lawlessness in one area of the law stand, you give license for people to have lawlessness in other areas that they don't necessarily think is fair. And we just can't have that because our Constitution the framework of our Constitution is dependent upon having a structure of laws to protect it. When you begin to break that down, you begin to erode democracy as we've known it. And the other piece of this is, this isn't just about the illegals coming here. You, in, in California, L.A. County, 95 percent, 95 percent of all warrants for murder are for illegals. Six, we, we've had, um, uh, we, we have 63% um, of the people occupying HUD housing are illegal, 63%. And your mom or my mom may have worked all their lives. My mother raised 13 children. My father's an immigrant, so I'm not anti-immigrant. My father came directly from England, but he did it the right way. But say my, when my father passed that my mother needed, she raised 13 children, they did all the right things, supported their churches, their civic organizations, and on and on and on. Now my mother's widow needs support for all that she paid in over the years to get into housing. She's put on a waiting list because 63% of the people that are in there came here, contributed almost nothing, and are here illegally. Illegally. So... So my mother has to wait. And this is what's going on in our country. What's happening is people are getting frustrated. Look at, look at what's going on in our schools. You have, you have teachers who are doing charades in classrooms because the kids can't speak the language. So the rest of the children, who normally would be getting the lessons based on instruction, have to wait while teachers do charades to try to get these kids to catch up. So the time lost for the children who otherwise would be getting more instruction is harmful. And most of the children that are, that are put in these schools who are undocumented are, are at a disadvantage because they don't know the basic, many of them don't know the basic um, language of their own country and therefore are going to have it almost impossible to teach English. You can talk to any teacher about that. We're hiring more nurses, more doctors, more counselors. Uh, but we have to have more people that speak different languages that we otherwise didn't have to have in the schools. And what's happening is if you move, say, for example, you move to another neighborhood and you have a child that wants to, to go to a different neighborhood school, you have to provide, as an American citizen, proof that you live there. You have to have the birth certificates, yours and theirs. You have to have the inoculations, all of these things. If you come here illegally, you can't ask for that. You can't even ask if they're illegal. And so what's happening is it's not fair to the kids who are being brought here, put in a classroom setting where they can't speak the language and are having to be put in a position where the other kids might be getting frustrated because they're having to sit there while the teachers are doing charades. So it's not fair to the kid that the child that's there is getting... It's not fair, fair to either one. Either one. Right. Either one. The mayor of Lynn said, you know what? I cannot sustain anymore. My schools are busting at the seams. She had a 25-year-old in the high school. But they couldn't, because they can't verify, the, they can't verify, they're saying they're 17, but they can't verify it because the documents aren't real. But they can't verify that because they have to accept whatever document well, comes Excuse in. me, but weren't you involved in a verification program, like a work verification? Well, I've been pushing for right. e-verify. Yes. And, and the other thing that, as I said about the border security, um, look, we need to, we need to have, bring the Israelis in. I've been saying this time and time again, national shows, local shows, bring in the Israelis. Nobody knows border security better than the Israelis. They're, they're exceptional at it. Bring them in, sit them down with our experts, and let's put together a multifaceted, comprehensive uh, border plan and a plan to secure our points of entry. 
get E-Verify, get the airports with the bio biometrics that they need. And we, have the, we have the, uh, the wherewithal. Of Techno course. Technologically speaking, we have it. Right. There's no question. We can utilize it. And, and, the, and the Israelis have come up with all kinds of new inventions. I mean, we help them with, with Iron Dome, of course, but, but they, have, they have a very sophisticated plan there. I've, I've been there on all the borders, Gaza, the Golan Heights, West Bank, and they have, they have seismic sensors. They have, they've got um, uh, observation stations manned by people 24 hours a day. Uh, they have other types of technology. So the point is, look, we're, we're at a very critical time in our country. Uh, this is not about being an Italian immigrant. My father's an immigrant. This is about making sure that we control, like we did back in Ellis Island, the number of people coming in. Do you know uh, the first person to institute deportation was John Adams. John Adams was the first one to start deporting illegals. And, and we started our Border Patrol in 1924. So this is not a new problem for us. We need it. It's just because, escalated. That's all. Yes. <laughs> yeah, to a point where we can't sustain it. Right. Our hospitals right. can't sustain it. Our medical costs are going up. Um, but, but it's important for the American people that we, we have a controlled number of people coming in so that our economy can grow and support the people who are coming here instead of taking more out of the American people's pockets when we can't sustain the numbers that they're allowing to come in because they're just so overwhelming. So be, before closing, uh, Sheriff, um, I asked you an awful lot of questions and you were so kind to, uh, to answer them truthfully and, and, and uh, I appreciate that. But there must be something that I probably missed would you like to, you know, a question or some type of comment that you'd like to make that well, I, we, I didn't give you the opportunity to? Well, no, we, you know, we have some <laughs> exciting things on the, on the horizon. I, I've been, uh, I just spoke with the president of the National Sheriff's Association. <clears throat> I've been working on a concept of a prisoner Peace Corps, uh, which, would, would, um, which would bring sheriff's departments in a sort of four quadrants around the nation. And, and my whole concept is around, um, say, for example, Louisiana, when the hurricane hit that quadrant of sheriffs would send perhaps 10 of their own inmates to that location. And the host sheriff would create a, a work camp, a place that they could live, temporary. And the inmates would go out every day and they would rebuild, help to rebuild that community, clean the streets, get rid of the debris. Um, we, um, m my first initiative was Afghanistan. And I had been dealing with um, um, the former attorney general, uh, Ed Meese. He put me on the Pentagon Bureau at the time. The Pentagon Bureau had too many other things happening with Afghanistan, so they weren't able to begin even thinking about logistics. But this would be a program where inmates, and we did this with uh, Haiti. When Haiti happened, although I didn't send any inmates there, uh, we set up our facility up top, our big garage up there. I called all the police stations and the state police barrack here and said, will you be drop, mind being drop-off points for the, your community for supplies, for food, uh, clothing, uh, medications, basic medications, things like that, toys for kids, and they all agreed. And our truck would go around and pick up all this stuff. And we had military transport boxes that my staff were able to get. And we put them in the upper garage. And these inmates all day would sort between women's shoes, women's clothes, children's clothes, toys, on and on and on. And I went up there one day and I said, let me ask you a question. If I said to you tomorrow, that I would send, be able to send you to Haiti to help rebuild Haiti. Would you be interested? Every one of them said tomorrow, oh, send course, me. Of course they would. And you know, they, they weren't able to go because we, we hadn't, we, the program hasn't been completely developed. But, but they did get a chance to be a part of an international issue that they could see on the news when they saw the news in the, in the common area of their unit. That, hey, I'm making a difference for these people there from Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Yeah. And, and my whole idea is, look, these prisoners, inmates, go back to the same neighborhoods when they get out, same routines, same temptations. Let's give them a chance to go somewhere where they can be involved in, in an issue. Some of these kids have never walked through a forest in their life, and they live in New Bedford. Some of them have never seen a building over 12 stories, never been to Boston. Many kids who are now adults. Let's give them a chance to see the world. Let's give them a chance to get a perspective where they made a difference. They did something. Imagine if they went to Afghanistan and helped rebuild roads and schools. They're going to see kids with one arm, one leg, victims of the war, 
that they're going to come back and they're never going to forget. They can't forget. They'll be emblazoned in their memory. Life, life wondering, hey, I wonder how that kid, what are that kid's doing, or that kid I ran into there, you know, that I helped build that school for. They'll, they'll not be, won't be able to forget those faces. <clears throat> and those, those kinds of things can be life-changing experiences. And at a minimum, they're going to be a benefit for the people in the community that they're helping, or the country that they're helping, and, um, and a benefit for them. So, <coughs> excuse me, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> it's a program that uh, the national, uh, President of the National Sheriff's is very interested in, in working with me on. Rightfully so. It sounds terrific. Yeah, it's different in, a, it, the, the, you know, military transports, things like that, that we can easily get them places. And we'd send probably one deputy from each department to go down there and work mm -hmm. with those sheriffs <clears throat> on, that, on that project. The other thing that I'm very interested in doing, I'm working on now, is to try to f get government to focus more on getting kids before they ever come through the front door. Instead of the cost and the repetitive costs of trying to deal with their long-established dysfunctional behaviors after they come in. If we can keep children from coming into the front door, we're going to cut recidivism very quickly in 10 years. But we have to have our energies and our focus back on getting kids to community centers, putting sports programs back in the schools so that kids have a place to go and stay away from the lure of drug dealers. Sheriff, uh, it was a pleasure to have you, and thank you for coming, most importantly. Great to be here. And th this ends another uh, <coughs> program of Your Town by Stanley Mickelson. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me.